Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're so glad you're here. Let's open in prayer tonight. Father, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that is present, that leads and guides us, leads us in all truth, opens our hearts and gives us illumination, teaches us how to worship and pray. We thank you for tonight, what you're going to do, and our desire is to know you more tonight, to know your ways, to walk in your perfect will, not your permissible will, but your perfect will. Reveal yourself to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. At your name, the mountain shake and grumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice. Your people cry out, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. Praise you and honor you and glorify your name, Lord. You are our God, Lord Jesus, and we praise you and you alone, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Every grain of sand Kings and nations 
times we should draw closer to you Lord put all our trust in you Lord draw me close to you
draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm okay. You are my desire. Nothing else could take your place Feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to you You're There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is over Victory is won. He has risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before. There's a day that's drawing near When the darkness breaks to light And the shadows disappear And my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He has risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will.
there's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's a ready man we're gonna go pretty soon we're gonna go up with the lord thank you lord Good, good, good. 
Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We praise your great name, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and praise you. And Lord, we open our hearts to your word tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Let's open in prayer. Father, again, we look to you. We look for illumination. We look for understanding. We ask that you would grant us that grace that leads us again to repentance. Because, Lord, we know that we have not always exalted you the way that you should be exalted. So tonight we want to see you. We want to see you in your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount and, and taking so much time looking here and looking there, and, and I want to kind of, kind of give it like a little summary of what we've seen in the book of Matthew as we move through. So we focus on the theme of the book of Matthew. Now, I titled the message, The Power of the King, because when we started this book, Matthew, we began and we saw the birth of the king, and looking at that, we looked at his genealogy, and then we looked literally at his birth, and then we saw the reception of the king first, the wise men that had come to him, and then the, again, we saw King Herod. And we saw, again, the, the persecution, the hatred, the anger, the, the conflict. And the next thing that we came to is we saw that dedication of the king. Well, that was, again, if you remember the forerunner, John the Baptist. And he was the one that was paving the way for the king. And then we saw the baptism of the king. And the father speaking from the heaven, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased in. And then from there, we went to the temptation of the king. Tempted in three areas, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Same way that you and I are, are tempted, yet he was without sin. And as we looked at that, we saw how we can be victorious when temptation comes, and that's using the word of God, relying upon that word of God. And then we saw his ministry. And then we went and we came to what was the Sermon on the Mount, as I mentioned earlier. And that was the message of the king. The message, it started with the Beatitudes, if you remember. And then his relationship, the king's relationship to the, to the law, his interpretation of the law, he spoke as no one spoke. He spoke as one who had authority, not as the scribes. We saw his rebuke of the hypocrisy and his invitation to call. Call you and me to come to the king. But as we look for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at chapters 8 through 10. The focus is going to be upon the power of the king. It's not enough just to be able to, to say and give the word, but he is all-powerful, and we're going to see that he's 
power over this demonic realm, over nature. And we're going to see all those elements and focus upon them one by one. Now, going back just for a moment to Matthew 7, 28, notice what it says. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for his teaching was one as authority, as I mentioned, not as the scribes. And now he's going to do these supernatural miracles. Miracles, and we'll talk more about that later on, but miracles, basically, they're supernatural. They defy the laws that God put in place. Oftentimes, people call something a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's just the laws that God has instilled. A miracle we're going to see is something that's instantaneously, immediately it happens. It's not a delay over a long period of time. That's just the laws being fulfilled that God has already put those things into place. But it's where God stops and changes the course of action in this life, in the life of people. See, these are his credentials, let's say. They prove that he was who he said he was and who he claimed to be. The King of Kings, the Promised One, the Anointed One, the Messiah. So it demonstrates his authority over all realms of life is what we're going to see. He healed men of all kinds of physical problems, leprosy, palsy, fever, death, blood disease, and blindness. He healed them both of the source and the after effects. There was no need in a, in a miracle for therapy because they were healed. He healed them both in public and he, he healed them in private. He healed them with a touch. He healed them with the word far away. Where his physical presence wasn't really required. He just simply spoke just as he did in creation. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He is the I am of the scripture. We'll see that he controls nature and the demonic world. And all of these marks will show that he has the authority, the ability to delegate this power he delegates them, we're going to see, to the 12, to the apostles. In many of these miracles later on in 2 Corinthians, we'll talk about these were the, the signs of a true apostle, meaning sent by God, sent by Jesus Christ. Well, in John 10, 38, notice what it says with me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. There he's claiming to be equal with God, but he's doing these things that only God could do. In fact, in the book of John, the Gospel of John, there were miracles there only God could do. And then in Acts 2.22, it says, The men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as yourselves know. Josephus and other historians record these miracles, don't know how to explain them, but they don't deny them. Well, look with me in verse 1, chapter 8, verse 1. It says, when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Now, Jesus, if you remember, was on the Sermon on the Mount. It's not a, a very large hill. But he was there. He was teaching. He was speaking to the people, and the crowds are, are following him. He spoke these words with authorities. They said, but now he's going to show them this miraculous power that only God could do. Follow with me in Isaiah, Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 6. Say to those who are anxious in heart, take courage and fear not. 
Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The retribution of God will come, but he will save you. And then the eyes of those who are blind will be opened. The ears of those who are deaf will be unstopped. And then those who are limp will leap like a deer. The tongue of those who cannot speak will shout for joy. For the waters will burst forth in the wilderness and the streams and the desert. This was a messianic passage. These were the things that the Messiah would do. These are things that they were watching for. Literally, he would do these. These, again, are those credentials that I mentioned. But he would do much more than just that. When I look back at that passage just for a moment, he'd open the eyes of the blind. Those that are spiritually blind, when they're born again, they see things that they never understood before. He opens the ears that they hear the wonderful things of his word, his law. Those who didn't know how to walk in a godly way now walk. And they walk in a way that brings glory to God. Those who were spiritually dead, he raised spiritually alive. They were born again. All of these pointed to the fact he was the Messiah. This is what we're going to see. So when he came down this mountain, it refers to him coming down this mountain from the Sermon on the Mount, and, and the people are still gathering around him. We don't know the numbers. We know one of the largest crowds was 12,000 people, roughly. And this hill would easily have covered that area. Well, look with me in verse 2, though. We see a cry, a man with leprosy came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you're willing... You can make me clean. The man in our text, he was a leper. Lepers were considered untouchables. In the ancient world, leprosy was probably one of the most terrible of all diseases. There was no medical treatment. Most people were considered, if they were considered lepers, were considered dead. They were the walking dead at that time. Dead to society and socially, they couldn't get around other people. As they walked down the streets, they had to walk away from everybody, and they would cry out, unclean and unclean. They couldn't go into the synagogue. They couldn't meet with their family. They couldn't go up and greet anyone. They lived a life of isolation. No one dared to touch a leper. In fact, in Israel, it was, it was illegal to even greet one, to, to speak across the road at one. They were barred from Jerusalem. They were barred from all the cities that had walls. They had to stay on the outside. A very lonely life. A miserable life. It's interesting. I'll throw the thought. We'll talk maybe more about it later, but Leprosy was always, in a biblical, spiritual sense, related to sin. And these people were considered sinners. They were unclean. That's why one of the reasons they use this word unclean. See, the Jewish reader understood that leprosy simply rendered a, spiritual, a person spiritually unclean. He could not come near anyone. In fact, they even took it another step further. He was cursed by God. Some had taken it far to say, well, his sins were so horrible that God put him in that state. And that's not necessarily true in every case. Because we know some people have been born with certain things that were cursed, and it was so God would receive the glory when God would heal them. The clearest biblical example, again, is, is judgment in the Scripture, uh, was with Miriam, Moses' sister who was stricken with leprosy and speaking against Moses when he married the woman from Ethiopia who had remained outside the camp until God had healed her. Moses pleaded, God, heal her. Don't leave her in this state. But notice this, Jesus touched the leper. 
it was his touch that could have contaminated him as far as anybody else was concerned. They would have been a part of the curse. They would have been contaminated. They would have been affected. But Jesus' touch brought grace to their lives. His touch restored them. Tonight, I think all of us need a touch of the Savior. A touch that will change us for eternity. Maybe you're having a struggle in a certain area and, and God needs to touch that area of your life and certainly I'm talking spiritually. We know in eternity when we get to heaven, he will touch all of our bodies in that sense that we'll be whole, complete, no pain, no sorrow. But now the best thing can be is that we be spiritually set free. Notice what the, the leper did. He, he simply came to Jesus. And when he came to Jesus, he really came to the fountains of living waters, the scripture describes so often. A man with leprosy, against their law, violating their law, came directly to Jesus. Perhaps pressed through the crowd and the crowd partying. But he came to Jesus. He came in the presence of the, the crowd. And now people probably fearfully begin to pull away and run away. You know what I bet? Jesus, my own opinion, quote, my opinion, Jesus probably had a big smile on his face as the man pressed to him. He was not ashamed. He was not fearful. He pressed through the crowd. He also, if you notice in that text, he came worshiping him with a deep and genuine reverence. He bowed down before him. A respect. I believe that he probably understood more than the most of the crowd did because on the outside he would hear the people talking from a distance walking by. Many were just following after the signs and wonders and things, but he heard and he put the pieces together. His processor was processing and thinking and meditating. If there's anyone that could heal me, it was Jesus. He came confessing his need. His cry was, make me clean. Make me clean. He, he was acknowledging his condition, his real condition. And that's something that people can come to Jesus, they can say a sinner's prayer, but do they acknowledge their sinfulness and really their need of, of him? Many come, but they don't come with honesty, confessing that genuine need. He came believing. There was no doubt in his mind, not any at all, that Christ had the power to heal him. Only his, his will. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So many cry out to God, but they don't believe he has the power to do it. I don't know why they cry. There was something different about this man because he was isolated and all alone. He had time to, to think and watch and see, to reflect upon his life. And he had no place else to turn but to Jesus because everyone else would turn away from him. Look with me in verse 3. We see the compassion. Jesus reached out with his hand and touched him saying, I'm willing, be cleansed. And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. The creator who spoke all things into existence, not fearful of anything, reached out and touched him. 
many of us know that touch of a Savior, a touch maybe of, of forgiveness, a healing, or a touch of peace. Jesus is very personal to us. There are times that people have told me they just knew it was him sustaining them and holding them up, walking through the circumstances with him. But he touched the leper, and he touched him with what was an incurable disease. The result was, though, he was cleansed and he was transformed. See, when a person comes and confesses his sins, God's faithful and just to cleanse him of all unrighteousness. And he's transformed. Perhaps a better thought would be that when a person is born again, he's cleansed and transformed. He's a new creature in Christ, new desires. Leprosy, though, in the Bible, remember, is a, this picture of a sin, the incurable disease. Without a touch from Jesus, there was no cure. And what I see oftentimes of Jesus, he's always gravitating to the, the one that has the greatest need. He knows what that need is. He knows what is going on in your heart and your mind. He's very good at drawing things out of you, bringing it to the surface, because he doesn't want to leave you in that place where you're at now, isolated, separate. It's only Christ's healing touch that could ever miraculously take away our sins and restore back a joy, a peace to restore back what the locusts have eaten, to give us a second chance, a third chance. He took away the guilt, the shame, the pain, and even the past. The hardest one there, though, is the past. We know that we're washed and washed as white as snow. But sometimes we have a hard time forgetting the past, those that have hurt us or those who have hurt us or we've hurt others. We say we want to have our, our past taken away, but we don't let go of it. We're quick to remind others of the past, their past failures, the things they've done. When we come to him, he takes it all away if we just cast our cares upon him. I believe this is what the leper did. He came and he left it all with Jesus. The guilt, the shame, the pain, the past. See, just as this leper realized again his inability to change his circumstances, he went to Christ. And that's true for every person that comes to this point. There's no place else to turn, and he's there. And the greatest miracle of any miracle is that of a person being born again. A new heart. A new desire. A new relationship. Jesus is calling today. And I love that. Because he says, come just as you are. So often we think we need to get our lives together. Or I need to do this, or I need to do that, and, and then I'll come. The leper, <laughs> he came just as he was. No matter what you did, he says, come just as you are. Come all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, Jesus loves to touch people. Jesus is, is, is love. See, God is love, and he loves to touch you with the hand of love. Notice with me in verse 4, we see a, 
a command. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest. In the presence, the offering of Moses command is a testimony to them. The question always arises, why did Jesus instruct the the healed man not to tell anyone, but, but go to the priest? First of all, it was the law. It's true, he had a, a new walk and he had a new testimony and, and I'm sure he wanted to tell his family and go see the family and the friends and everything that Jesus had done in him. But also Jesus didn't want to be known as a healer. You know, there's a lot of people who make great um, things about healing and miracles today and certainly every one of us love them. Jesus, it wasn't the time for him to head to the cross. First, it needed to go to the priest and go through the the right channels. A a sacrifice would have to be given. A testimony would be given to the high priest that they would know the Messiah was here and they would be without excuse. They would have to choose to receive and acknowledge that truth or reject it. See, Jesus is is preparing the way for the nation because it was these religious leaders that were leading. So his first approach would be there, and the second would to to slow the people so they wouldn't, again, exalt him and try and push him into this place of power because he would go from his miracles and he would go back and he would teach. He would preach, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. In Mark 1.38, it says this. He said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so they may preach there also. For that is what I came for. Jesus never came to to heal the people. But because he's love, he had to touch them when he saw them, when they pressed Certainly he would do these miracles because they would testify that he was the Messiah. But he came to bring the good news, the hope to hopeless people. And sometimes hopeless people do not want hope. They only want band-aids. They only want something to comfort them for the moment. They don't want true peace and they're not willing to deal with it because it might cost him. The leper had nothing to lose. When a person realizes he's just like a leper, that is spiritually, what do you have to lose? You have everything to gain when you come to the king. One well, our text, let's look at the, the next miracle. It's really the authority. It shows that Jesus has this power, this authority over a paralysis. It's in verse 5. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home and terribly tormented. I love this. When you look at a centurion, this is a military man, a Roman citizen. He would have been over somewhere between maybe 60 and 160 people, most commonly probably about 100. The scripture always mentions again that these centurions are people, good people, people of faith. People who understand authority and they're submissive, respectful, reverent. Again, Jesus entered Capernaum, Capernaum being really his home base. It was there that he would reach out and go to. Capernaum was just a little north of, again, the, where the Sermon on the Mount was, where the Beatitudes were taught, and just below that, uh, was a place that was called Ginsor. Beautiful hub, beautiful area. 
And this is the area that Jesus would move. And he would do more miracles in this area, and especially Capernaum. Let me show you in Matthew 11, verse 23. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You'll, not be, you'll be brought down to Hades. For if the miracles that occurred in you had occurred in Sodom, it, it would have remained until this day. And people saw the power of the king. But in reality, they rejected the king. Oh, they wanted to touch, maybe to help them, but they wouldn't receive him as their king, their savior, their Lord, the Messiah. It goes on in verse 7, Jesus said to him, that's the centurion, I will come and heal him. Can you imagine what that centurion felt like? It was his servant. It was somebody who was dear. Somebody had served him. Somebody was close. He could have bought another slave, but, but this was somebody that was special to him. Look with me in verse 8. We see his confidence, but the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and, and he comes. And to my slave, do this. And he does it. First of all, what we see is this centurion. He, he has this incredible sensitivity to Jewish traditions. For a Jewish person to, to come to a, a Gentile house would be defiled. But Jesus is willing to come. There's no place in this world that Jesus wouldn't come and heal a person and touch a person if they just call upon his name. So the centurion uses his knowledge, again, of, of authority. Not fully understand it, but, but he understands this power. He understands this, this idea of delegation. Just, just say the word and it will be done is what he's saying. What incredible faith when you stop and think about it. He started humbly, un, unworthy of receiving him even to his home. Acts 10, 28 says this, and he said to them, you yourselves know that it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, yet God has shown to me that I am not to call any person unholy or unclean. See, all of these are little glimpses of God's desire to reach out to the Gentiles, not only to reach out to the Gentiles, but as we follow through that the Jewish people and the large portion will reject the Messiah. The scriptures clearly comes to his own, but they received him not. Look with me in verse 10. Now, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who were following him, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith in anyone in Israel. Every time I read that, it, it just baffles me. God is amazed. He's amazed at this great faith. He's also amazed at the unbelief of the Jews who reject him. Twice in the Gospels, Jesus is amazed at the Gentile centurion and the unbelief of the Jews, as I mentioned. Matthew records two Gentile miracles. This one that we're looking at now, and then, then the healing of the, the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. In both of these cases, the Lord's impressed with their great faith. Great study is, is sometimes just to look up faith, great faith. Do you find it? What kind of faith do you have? I know we just need faith the size of a mustard seed to be saved, but, but do we grow? Do we mature? 
Hudson Taylor many years ago being introduced as this illustrious man of faith. He says, he was embarrassed. He said, it's not hard to have faith in one who is so faithful to me. Has God been faithful to you? What is your testimony of his faithfulness? When God has been so faithful, it's not hard to have great faith, but to this Gentile, he never experienced that in the way that you and I have. But he chose to believe, and he chose to trust. See, that's great faith when a person chooses to believe, trust, and rest. And that's what this Gentile did. Again, this is really a picture, indication that the Jews who would not believe, but the Gentiles would. Now, we know the early church for the first 30 years was primarily Jewish people they went, but... Not long after that, there were more Gentiles than Jews. Let me read from Ephesians 2, verse 12 and 13. Remember that you were at times separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you previously were far away, but have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Probably a play on words going back and thinking they were afar off, but, but no one's that far from Christ if they recognize that need and will throw their pride out the door and they will cry out upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Look with me in verse 11. And I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out in outer darkness, in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, Jesus says this kind of faith will result in eventual salvation for, for a number of the Gentiles. This is what he's saying. While the faithless Jews will suffer eternal loss. It doesn't matter whether it's Jew or Gentile, because in the church we're we're one. But the faithful people of God from all over the world at one point will be gathered together and we will be one. The Jews, going back to Romans, were given more light and more understanding. Yet they became comfortable in who they were. They were Jews. They were God's chosen people. Sadly, today, there are many in the church today who are comfortable being in the church and their baptism and these things, but really not comfortable in the arms of Jesus. They may be cast out, too. The Jews should have known that when the Messiah came, that the blessings would be for the Gentiles as well. Look with me in Isaiah 66, 12. For this is what the Lord says, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and in the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you will be nursed, and you will be carried on, on the hip, and rolled back and forth on my knees. And in verse 19, the same chapter, and I will put a sign among them and send survivors from them to the nations of Tarshish and Put and Lud and Meshach and Tubal and Javan and to the distant coastlines that have neither heard of my fame nor seen my glory, and they will declare my glory among the nations. It's always been God's desire to see all one in him. Job was not a Jewish person, but he was saved. And again and again through the scripture, you see the very heart of God. It's in verse 13, we see the cure. Jesus said to the centurion, go. 
shall be done for you as you believed. And the servant was healed the very moment. See, a miracle, when God heals someone or does a miracle, notice the word here, the very moment, or we saw earlier, immediately. When God does something, it's like as he speaks it, it is done. Sometimes people are saying, well, that's a miracle, and that's a miracle, and that's a miracle. And I think sometimes, in my own opinion, they're robbing God of his glory because these are laws that he's put in effect that naturally will follow when this is done and this is done. A miracle stands out above all things. It's something that no doctor, no one else could do. No one could copycat. No one could fake. And it says he healed at that very moment. It was when he spoke in his mind. It was done instantly. I remember a group of us laying hands upon a man one day. And we prayed for him. And he described it afterwards as if he felt something inside him just explode, like taking your fingers and squeezing a grape, and all the juices just popped out. He felt this explosion instantly as we prayed. All symptoms, everything went away. Why does God one time heal this person and not that person? One, because of God's glory. Two, God knows what's best for each person. Sometimes it's that situation they're going through will be the very thing that brings them on their knees to cry out and have a relationship with a loving Savior. Notice he has authority over sickness. That's in verse 14. When Jesus came to Peter's house, he saw the mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she got up and waited upon him. I've heard people say, well, this is very selfish of him. Again, she was sick. She, she needs to, to lay down. She needs to rest. When God heals someone instantly, it's done as if they were never sick and never wounded or anything before. They don't need to recuperate. There are no side effects. It's done. There's another thought here again. And Jesus finds her in bed and Jesus touches her. Some have said, that's a demonic thing. We don't honestly know. But I know that when God touches people, he touches them that he might use them. He heals them that they might serve him. Because that's where we find our joy. That's where we find our peace. That's where we find that real love and joy. The moment she was touched, there was this ability. It's like all of her life came back in her. And you know if you have a fever, you just, you're exhausted. You just feel wiped out. But all of a sudden, the life came back in her. I've known people that are suffering from depression. There's been times when people have laid hands upon them, and it's this, all of a sudden, this life and this energy comes back in them because God is moving still today miraculously in many ways. God knows what's best for you and knows what's best for me. Again, it was instant with her as well. So he has this authority over sickness. He's over uh, authority over the demonic realm and we'll talk a little bit tonight and but we'll really pick that up more later on in the chapter. Notice what 
me in verse 16. It says, Now when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word. He healed all who were, were ill. And this happened so that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet would be fulfilled. He himself took our illness and carried away our diseases. Now, first of all, this was written to Israel. That's the context. It comes from Isaiah. And the idea is here, this is one of the ways that they would recognize their Messiah. Now, does God heal today? Yes, he does, but he's not always going to heal. And, and sometimes I think people take this and stretch this text, what it's saying, and the purpose of this text. This text was used here to present that Jesus had the power as the king. He had the authority as a king. Not just the words of the king, but the power to back it up. Now, it's interesting as, as we talk about it again, and this is on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. That's where he's at, okay? And they bring a, a, a demon-possessed man. I want to say this. Nowhere in the scripture is there ever any believer demon-possessed. No place in the scripture does it. There's many people that teach it does, but that's not true. You can find oppression. Oppression is from the outside. You understand that, and I understand, but possession is taking over your heart, your life from the inside, and you're not in control of anything. People today sometimes are very obsessed with demonic activity. And the reality is this demonic activity is going to keep on increasing right up until the very end. As Satan, the leader of that, he is a liar from the beginning, and he will lead people in all the lies. They will seek after his power. They will look after his false signs and wonders. But in this case, Jesus just simply cast out the spirits with his word. But see, this wasn't common of the Jewish people this time. Oh, I, I know they had their exorcists. But that doesn't mean they really cast out demons. They, they went through the, the moves. They did things to, to try and, and, and showmanship and call attention and manipulate the people. Let me read. It's not from the Bible in this case. It's from the book Tobit. Two places I'm going to read, so they won't go on the screen. It's from the Apocrypha. It's, and the reason I'm reading this, because this is telling you what the, the Hellenistic, the, the Jewish people were thinking. This is what was happening. It's, it's somewhat a history, a little bit of it. But it's not the word of God. It just gives us some background. So in Tobit 6, 7, it says this, And he said unto them, Touching the heart and the liver... If a devil or an evil spirit trouble any, we must make smoke thereof before the man and the woman, and the party shall be no more vexed. And as for the gale, it is good to anoint the man that he hath a whiteness in his eyes, and he should be healed. And then in verse 16 of that same book, Tobit 6, when thou shalt come into the marriage chamber thou shalt take ashes of perfume and shalt lay upon them some of the heart and the liver and the fish and shall make smoke upon it, kind of the same thing, and the devil shall smell it and flee away and never come again any more. And when thou shalt come to her and rise up, both of you, and pray to God, which is merciful, and you will have pity upon you and save you and fear not, for she appointed unto thee from the beginning, and thou shalt preserve her, and she shall go with thee. Moreover, I suppose that she shall bear thee children. And I'll stop there. It's like a witch hunt. You find people doing that today. They've always been doing 
this little secret here, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. There have been times when I've gone out and I've prayed for people in different situations and turned around and people are throwing salt and all kinds of things. And what we need to do is rely upon the Lord. Trust in the Lord alone, not superstition. See, when believers come into Christ, we're, we're to let go of these worldly things. These are a deception to to draw us away from the true and living God who can simply say the word and go. For a believer, greater is he who is in me than is in this world. And if the Lord is for me, who could ever be against me? That's the greatness of faith. That we have this great, great God. Well, the prophecy, as I mentioned again in verse 17, is from Isaiah, the servant. It was focusing simply on Jesus as the, this messianic healer. He had the power of the king. In fact, this is the first really mention of this from that passage in Isaiah 52, 13. It goes all the way through 53. The suffering servant. Jesus had the ability to drive out those spirits. By the command stands in stark contrast to the suffering of this world. Tonight, tomorrow, just call upon the Lord. He's waiting, knocking on the door. He says, Come just as you are. Come with your needs. Come and sincerity in reverence and he will touch your life and your life will never be the same father thank you for this time thank you for the hope that you have given us the new life that you've given us the the change in our life all that you're doing you've done Thank you that we can look each day for your coming. What a purifying thought to think that you could come tonight, tomorrow. Lord, we want to be ready. We want to give ourselves over to you afresh tonight and say, Lord, cleanse us and wash us. Wash us with your love. Make our hands faithful. Help us to see you in all your glory as this powerful king. The king of kings, knowing that you are coming and you're coming soon for all of us to call upon your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
song, huh?